Good evening and welcome to this joint City Council Lane County Board of Commissioners work session. I'd like to call this September 21, 2020 City Council work session to order. And welcome also to the Lane County Board of Commissioners meeting, <coughs> excuse me, for September 21st, 2020. We'll open our meeting with you as well. Thank you for joining us in this remote meeting format we're using in response to Governor Brown's Stay Home, Save Lives order. This format enables us to meet, hear from the community and take care of business while keeping everyone safe. For work sessions like this one where there is no opportunity for public comment, those wishing to access this meeting can do so by watching the live stream available on our website. <coughs> Excuse me, <clears throat> the broadcast on Comcast Channel One or by calling into one of the phone numbers listed for this meeting on the public webcast and meeting materials web page. And as always, other avenues of communication with me, city councilors and commissioners are available, including email and voicemail. Thank you for joining us. And with that, I will turn this over to the city manager. Great, thank you, Mayor. Welcome everybody. Tonight you're having a joint work session for an update on our urban reserves planning work to date, focusing primarily on the four different options uh, that we've developed for your consideration. There's no action requested at this at this joint session. We'll be returning to the Eugene City Council on October 12th and to the Board uh, of County Commissioners, I believe on October 20th to get direction on your preferred urban reserves option. Based on that, staff will prepare an urban reserves adoption package to be considered in 2021 through a process that includes public hearings before the planning commissioners uh, county board and the city council. So you'll see there's a lot of faces here tonight. We have a lot of staff um, in addition to Steve and I. We have uh, a number of people from Eugene Planning and a number of people from Lane County as well as our uh, city attorneys that are representing us and the county attorney and as well as two community members. So we have John Broski and Howard Saxton that are co-chairs of the Envision Eugene Technical Advisory Committee. So we have a lot of people here tonight. Uh, we have a good presentation for you. We're lo really looking forward to the discussion. And as I even see Envision Eugene, I'm remembering that when John first asked me to go to PDD for six months, he asked me to go to just wrap up Envision Eugene. And that I was there for six years and it still wasn't wrapped up. And here we are still kind of talking about that next phase, which I know is really important to a number of people on this call. So with that, I think I'm turning it over to you, Rebecca. Is that correct? That's good. That is correct. Thank you. Thank you, city manager, board of commissioners, mayor, council. Welcome. We appreciate you being here. My name is Rebecca Gershow. I'm a senior planner with the Eugene Planning Division, and I am the project manager for urban reserves planning. I am going to be doing the majority of this presentation with Sophie McGinley, who is our assistant planner. Uh, we also, as the city manager just noted, have a number of staff here who have been supporting the project as part of our project management team. They will be answering questions following the presentation, county staff and city staff. And I wanted to primarily point out Lindsay Eichner who is our staff liaison with the county who has been um, working side by side with us closely on this project. Um, Keir Miller is also here um, as well as a variety of other folks who I can't actually see, but I know they're here and they're going to jump in at the end and help answer questions as necessary. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I'm going to try to keep this presentation brief give you enough information um, to answer questions, but as the city manager noted, we're coming back in October so we can provide additional information as necessary at that time. I'm going to move us over to the presentation and I'm going to hope that my kids who are back to school today aren't hogging up all of our bandwidth. Um, or you might hear me yelling in a second. Let's see. Here we go. Okay, so I'm going to get set up here. And please let me know if there are any technical difficulties. 
tonight we will be sharing information with you on the urban reserves options for your consideration as the city manager pointed out we're coming back to city council on october 12th and the board of commissioners on the 20th to receive your direction on a preferred urban reserve area following that direction staff will begin working on the formal adoption process with the goal of beginning public hearings this spring Urban Reserves is a partnership with the county to plan for the next two generations, as far out as 2062. We're identifying the best areas for Eugene to grow into based on beyond, excuse me, beyond our urban growth boundary when additional land is needed. So we're prepared to grow in a way that meets the community's needs and values. Urban Reserves identifies enough land for future housing and jobs, as well as for parks, schools, and services. However, land designated as Urban Reserves will remain rural until there is a need, and it is brought into Eugene's urban growth boundary through a formal process. Urban Reserves are important now for a number of reasons. As we all know, housing supply and affordability is a critically important issue now more than ever. As community members face significant challenges due to the pandemic, economic uncertainty, and wildfires, Urban Reserves is one piece of that puzzle. In 2015, the City Council, supported by the County Board of Commissioners, directed us to do this work and set aside funds to prepare an Urban Reserves proposal for your consideration. This is aligned with the work of our growth monitoring program and other projects focused inside the urban growth boundary, such as the middle housing code amendments. This is a quick slide just to say that we could not be doing this by ourselves. Urban reserves planning is a collaborative effort and we have been working with a wide variety of people and groups since 2018. This is attachment A in your packet. It shows the project's major phases in the middle with the different types of outreach we have undertaken summarized above and below. As you can see here, our goal is to receive direction on a preferred urban reserve option so we can then proceed with the formal adoption process in white. Back in spring 2019, we reported out to you on our technical analysis. That work, very high level here, included establishing our study area, identifying our land supply, and identifying how much land would be needed for urban reserves. Then in January of this year, we provided you with updates on our suitability analysis. While the technical analysis is highly quantitative, the suitability analysis is more qualitative. In this phase, we developed suitability criteria based on state guidance. We split the study area into 18 sub areas, then evaluated and removed the land that was unsuitable for urban reserves. We ultimately removed over 4,000 acres of land from further consideration. This was done for a variety of reasons. This land that we removed is in the gray shaded out areas on this map. The land uh, that the reasoning behind some of the removal included areas with significant flood hazards, steep slopes, high elevation, landslide and fire risk and difficulty to serve. This resulted in approximately 6,700 acres of suitable land that we then moved forward for further consideration. You can find the detailed suitability analysis reports and maps uh, in our project webpage. We shared this information at three study area open houses in January. Open, over 125 mostly county residents participated. In February of this year, the project management team developed eight preliminary options for discussion and refinement and received initial input from the Technical Advisory Committee, the ETAC, in early March. We were planning the next round of public meetings when COVID-19 hit and our plans were adjusted. We met with the ETAC virtually 
in May and June and refined the eight options to four for public review in July, which Sophie will talk more about. We developed these options based on state guidance that directed us to select suitable land for urban reserves in the following order. First, we brought in exception areas. These are lands already planned for rural, residential, commercial, or industrial uses. Then we brought in lands with marginal value for farming and forestry. And last, we brought in farm and forest designated lands selecting those properties with highest quality soils last. So in order to help us do that, we developed a land classification system for agricultural and forest resource land, which is shown here graphically. The class one is yellow. It's the highest capability soil and the most productive land. The class six, is the bottom of the range. It's purple. It's the lowest capability, least productive land. So smaller urban reserve options are limited to areas with lower value soil and larger options include more high value soil and more productive land. There is some flexibility for topography and serviceability, but this state directed process doesn't allow us just to pick and choose which areas we like for urban reserves. This option comparison table is attachment J in your packet. It's meant to compare some of the key data for the different options such as the size, type of land included, and average residential capacity, which is the estimated number of dwelling units per developable acre. So based on your previous direction, we began by developing option one, which meets 30 years of growth needs beyond the urban growth boundary planning period of 2032. It is the largest urban reserve allowed by law. We then chose to include the smallest option allowed by law, which is option four. It meets the needs of 10 years of growth beyond 2032. The other two options in the middle remove class one and two soils, taking farmland preservation into consideration. So I'm gonna run through our four options now. Here's option one, the 30 year option. It's, as I said, the maximum size allowed by law. On this map, the green is the land included and the red is the land that was previously identified as suitable that is excluded in this option. You will see the red increasing on the maps as we go through the options. This option includes enough land to meet 30 years of growth beyond 2032. It excludes in the red, some areas with high value soils, flood hazards, and potentially areas that are more difficult to serve, primarily because of their distance from the urban growth boundary. This option meets the community's growth needs for the longest time and has the highest average residential capacity of all the options. However, it also uses the most resource land of all the options. Here's another way of looking at uh, the resource land that's included in this option. While we removed some class one land from consideration, some is still remaining. As you can see right here in this area, uh, west of River Road and south of Beacon Drive uh, in the Aubrey sub area. You'll notice um, this is the area that's in play in the first three options, the rest of the urban reserve land remains the same. So that area we're gonna be talking a lot about. Option two includes enough land to meet 29 years of growth beyond 2032. Again, it's the green area. It also includes from urban reserve consideration, all class one land, the yellow in the previous slide. You'll notice that the red area has grown. This option protects the highest value farmland, class one soils from future urbanization and has the second highest average residential capacity of all the options. However, it still includes the second most resource land of all the options and removes easy to serve land from consideration. 
this uh, map shows the land in, you will see no class one yellow land um, remaining. The remainder of the urban reserve area has stayed the same. Option three includes enough land to meet 27 years of projected growth beyond 2032. You can see the red area on both sides of Prairie Road has grown again, as all agricultural properties with predominant class one and adjacent class two land or highest value soils have been removed from consideration. This option includes protections for more class two ag land than either of the previous options. And it has a more logical future development pattern than the 29 year option. However, in doing so, it removes more relatively easy to serve suitable land. And due to fewer large and flat properties, the average residential capacity drops further. Again, this map shows the removal of the class one and adjacent class two soils in this area. The small pockets of urban reserve land remaining here are mostly rural industrial exception areas. The remainder of the urban reserve area stays the same. Option four is the smallest size allowed by law. It is enough land to meet 10 years of growth beyond 2032. Lands excluded in red are all agricultural and forest properties with predominant class one through four land. It excludes the most resource land, farm and forest of all the options. However, the scattered pattern of properties by necessity limits opportunities for efficient and cost effective future neighborhoods. And due to more hilly, smaller parcels, it has the lowest average residential capacity. This map shows that we've removed all of the farm and forest parcels with predominant class one through four soils. Only the lowest value class six soils remain. There was an option that was considered but not moved forward for public consideration that was roughly in the middle size wise and this question has come up a bunch so I've included it here. This 18 year option included suitable farm and forest properties with the two lowest land classifications class four and six. However, also by necessity. It included islands of urban reserves, which are difficult for future serviceability in a similar pattern to the 10 year option you just saw. This shows the class six and class four land included in this preliminary option that we didn't move forward for public input. Um, I would now like to reintroduce Sophie McGinley, who's going to share a few slides on our virtual open house and I'm still going to control the screen and she um, can present for a bit. Thanks, Rebecca. Sure. Back in March, staff was preparing for a series of in person public meetings. When COVID-19 changed the way we work, we had to adapt our outreach. Ultimately, our engagement shifted mostly online into a month long virtual open house. It featured an interactive GIS story map, a video, an interactive Q&A feature, and a survey. 1,300 people attended the virtual open house over the course of the month. Over 870 people clicked on the story map, and 210 people completed the option survey. This shows a small sampling of our outreach activities and how they directly correlated to the number of visitors. This graph here shows that our outreach reached folks both inside and outside the urban growth boundary. Over a third of survey participants live or own property within the study area in the county, and about 60% live elsewhere. Here are the survey results showing overall support for the different urban reserve options. I would like to clarify that the survey is not statistically valid, but it provides useful input nonetheless. The most supported option was the 27 year option with almost 48% of survey takers supporting it. It is between 11 and 14 percentage points higher than the other three options. The 29 year option has 37% 37, 37 support with the least support 
and the 10 year option with 35% and the 30 year with 34%. Their survey also asked for open-ended input. The most prevalent comment by far was respondents desire to preserve farmland. 93 responses mentioned farmland preservation, which was almost half of the overall comments. Thank you, Sophie. Um, I'm now going to move to a different form of public input that we receive. This is um, our Eugene, Envision Eugene, excuse me, Technical Advisory Committee, which I've mentioned several times earlier. Um, in July, after 17 meetings, the ETAC provided their final input and recommendation to staff on urban reserves. There were two motions that were passed. The first was that the ETAC supports the urban reserves analysis as technically sound. It passed by a vote of 11 thumbs up, which represented supporting, and one thumb sideways, which was a reservation or concern. The one uh, vote of concern was from Thousand Friends of Oregon, who expressed their desire that the residential capacity assumptions could reflect the House Bill 2001 changes. The second motion was the recommendation of option three, the 27 year option that preserves class one and the adjacent class two land with the acknowledgement that the year range is an estimate based on current population forecasts and existing land use code. It passed by a vote of 10 thumbs up and two thumbs sideways. The two thumbs sideways votes represented the Lane County Home Builders Association who expressed a preference, preference for the largest urban reserve option and Thousand Friends of Oregon who expressed a preference for the smallest urban reserve option. I would also like to acknowledge the hard work of this committee. The 13 members, including Councillor Ye, have a wide range of perspectives and opinions, but always listen and treat each other respectfully. Uh, the two co-chairs, Howard Saxon and John Borowski, as the city manager noted, are joining us tonight and will be available for questions. We then, in August, met with both planning commissions. We had two meetings with each planning commission. On August 17th, the Eugene Planning Commission agreed with the ETAC and the public input, identifying both as important considerations. They felt that option three, the 27 year option, was a long enough timeframe to allow for growth and flexibility and preserve high value farmland both. The motion passed unanimously seven to zero. On August 18th, the Lane County Planning Commission voted five to three to recommend to the Board of Commissioners the 30 year option, but with a plan policy requiring that the class one and two farmland in the Aubrey sub area be the last of the urban reserve land to be considered for expansion of Eugene's urban growth boundary. Here's a graphic representing those recommendations. On the right is option three, which the Eugene Planning Commission endorsed, and on the left is the 30-year option, as adjusted in the Lane County Planning Commission recommendation, showing the land that would be considered last for inclusion in the urban growth boundary, as described in the county's recommendation. That would be this area right here that is hashed. As we've said a couple of times now, after this evening, we will be coming back to both bodies separately for direction on a preferred urban reserve option on October 12th to the city council and on October 20th to the board of commissioners. After receiving direction from both bodies, staff will begin working on the formal adoption process. And now I would be happy to open it up for questions. I can keep the, um, slides up or I can stop sharing. Uh, it's a little easy for me sharing? to see the participants if you stop sharing, yeah. Okay, let me do that. And people can ask if they need to see a slide. Uh, I, while we're making that adjustment, I wanna thank you very much for this presentation and particular thanks to the ETAC. 17 meetings is a lot of meetings over a long period of time and a lot of technical work. So really appreciate uh, your your commitment 
to this to this incredible undertaking. Uh, as we go into the um, uh, around the around the circle here for questions from counselors and commissioners, I'm going to offer that we will start with with three minute rounds on the first round, but uh, looking to Commissioner Buck that we might reduce that to two minutes if we find that we're kind of running out of time and questioning is going too long on the on the second round. So we'll we'll and we'll follow our usual uh, procedure if that's okay. We're, we'll begin with we'll give two counselors to one county commissioner, um, and uh, but but we'll make sure that everyone gets a fair fair hearing and plenty of opportunities. So uh, with that said, I'm looking for um, any raised hands of people who have a question. Oh, I see. Okay, Councillor Pryor and Councillor Semple. Thank you. Um, this is a, a great presentation and obviously a lot of work's gone into it, a lot of thinking. And I, I, I'm not quibbling at all with the uh, recommendations that are made or the options that, that have been come up with. Um, I think I don't want to think of them in terms of years. We don't know 30 years out whether 27 year or 29 year or 30 year. Really what this is about is the land that's being either in or out of the different options. So for me, the difference between a 30 year option and a 27 year option is this one has this land and this one doesn't have this land. And so I think I th that's the way my mind thinks about it. So it's not that we'll get to 27 and then we're in trouble. It's do we want to consider this land as part of our planning or do we want to not at this time? With that said, since there are no decisions that don't have consequences, I'll talk about something that I have actually talked about before. And that is um, the land that's in the urban reserve right now is predominantly land that is expensive to build on. And so if you want to build a home, particularly in that south area where you have slopes, you have bad soil, you have the whole host of conditions that make building homes there more expensive. And the lands that would be relatively inexpensive to build on if someone chose to do it are the areas that are up in the north. As we remove that land for whatever reason from our inventory in urban reserves, what we're doing is we're saying, we're recognizing that what's left is gonna be more expensive to build on. So if I'm thinking about affordable housing um, and I wanna be able to assist and work to support affordable housing, I'm intentionally creating a situation where it's much harder for me to build those affordable homes in the South Hills than it would be in the Northern part of town. So. I'm just saying this is, once again, a whack-a-mole issue. I can either have preserved farmland or I can have an easier way of building affordable housing. And I don't really wanna have to force that to be the problem, but in some ways, if we remove all of that land or remove significant amounts of that acreage where it's relatively easy to build affordable housing, we're doing it knowing that whatever's left is going to be more expensive and I and that just makes it more difficult to provide affordable housing. And so uh, for me, that's a trade off I have to think about. And so I'm not saying this option is better than that one or this land is better than that land. I'm thinking in terms of housing and what it costs to build housing. And this land is definitely easier to build affordable housing on than the part in the south. Okay, Councillor Semple. Thank you. Uh, this is a ton of work. I didn't get on the latest update, but I really remember the first one. So it's so impressive. Probably a simple question is in the 27 year option, why are only the class two that are adjacent included? Why are those other two big orange squares not included in this? Sure, that's a great question. Let me bring that slide up. Sorry, I'm not the fastest at screen sharing. Okay, 27-year um, option. Here it is in summary. 
Um, and then here's the version with the soil um, farm and forest land classification. We kept these two big parcels in. That was another option that we considered and that we didn't move forward. Um, we ended up leaving those two in for two similar but different reasons. This is all one parcel and it's connected to a parcel just on the other side of the urban growth boundary. It's actually um, the same and it's owned by the same property owner. And so um, they can already develop the portion beneath the urban growth boundary and it's directly adjacent to the urban growth boundary. So we kept it in as well as this portion over here, it's the same tax lot as the um, land just to the right or to the east of it. It's the same owner. It's just different soil classifications. Um, so there were different reasons, but it was uh, not, it, it, the reason why it didn't make this option is because it wasn't connected to these adjacent lands, but it is certainly, and then there are also little bits of class two soils um, that you can see little bits of orange through here that we decided for making consistent development patterns, it didn't make sense to pull those out, but that certainly was considered and could be considered. Thank you. It totally makes sense to leave the little orange ones um, in the western side. Um, I would like to have those two orange squares uh, be protected, but it sounds like with ownership and, and being able to develop it anyway, it's not a battle worth fighting. I am in support of the 27-year year option um, I would love to do the tenure because I think our soils are so important. And yes, we need to be able to build more housing, but we also talk a lot about smaller houses and more densely um, housed areas. So yes, some of those places might be more expensive to build, uh, but I, I just really want to keep those class one and class two soils. I've said that since I first decided to run, um, pave paradise and put up a parking lot. You are not going to take those houses down when we need to grow some more food. Um, I think it's irresponsible to, to not protect our agricultural land. Um, that's really important to me. I think this is great work. Um, and I support the 27 year option, although I certainly understand why the others may be appealing. So thank you for the work. Is there a commissioner that would like to say anything at this point? I don't see any hand raised. Um, I would like to say something. My hand is raised. Go ahead. Okay, Commissioner Farr, I'll get you in the queue uh, after the after Commissioner Sorensen. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate the presentation and the uh, tremendous amount of work that's gone into this. I would uh, <clears throat> say that in terms of the uh, public uh, process that will unfold, I think it's premature for us to uh, say uh, which ones we favor. I think it is fine to say which ones we think should be moved forward for future public uh, consideration. And I would certainly recommend that option four be one of the options that the public is allowed to consider as we uh, move through the process of further evaluating proposals and further um, a determination of, of what we want the urban reserve to look like. Um, I do have one question that I'd like staff to try to address and that is, we know the city of Eugene has a climate uh, action plan. We know Lane County is working on a climate action plan. Um, and my question is, in formulating the options, uh, were there any numeric uh, data assembled on the climate 
uh, impacts of the various uh, options. And uh, in particular, was the uh, was there any sort of lifestyle or threat analysis done with regard to fire risk um, and uh, sociological changes in the uh, sense that people are buying more and more houses uh, that are smaller than occurred in say prior um, decades. So those are my, I guess, three areas is were there any numerics on climate change impacts of the options put forward? Uh, is there a uh, risk analysis in terms of fire and uh, what sociological data in terms of demand for housing types that involve smaller and less expensive houses. Sure. So regarding the climate question, we specifically looked in our suitability analysis um, at a state directed process for suitability criteria. That process did include looking at things like energy costs, social impacts, um, environmental impacts, and we also, as part of our technical analysis and our suitability analysis, looked at things such as uh, landslide risk, uh, steep slopes, which are often coterminous with lands, with forested lands. Um, so we did a lot of coordination that related directly to climate impacts in part of our analysis as we were able to within the constraints of the state directed process and by the fact that we were looking at a study area with 27,000 acres and doing a high level review knowing that this land is to be designated in reserve and then if analyzed again to be brought into the urban growth boundary at a later point will be analyzed again in more detail. Um, we also looked at things like, um, like uh, connections to serviceability and to transportation and characteristics of the property, all which uh, impact the type of development that could occur on the property. Um, and I'm wondering if, um, Emily, do you want to talk about the process that we're using for moving the project forward uh, in the adoption phase and why we're looking at one option being um, identified for that next round of input? Sure, I, I think in terms of answering um, the, com the uh, commissioner's question, uh, just to fill in a little bit, those considerations that Rebecca talked about resulted in land being removed because it wasn't suitable. So early on, you saw one of her slides with, that showed suitability. So it wasn't just a consideration where it looked like it was a real concern that um, counterbalanced some of those other thoughts, land was taken out of consideration. Um, in terms of the process going forward, right now there are four legally uh, viable options that are before you. Um, and the staff basically would put in hours and hours and hours beyond imagination of work to develop that into a package um, that would be taken through the planning commissions and public hearings, and then to back to you with public hearings. And so a lot of these kind of considerations can really come out and be vetted a little bit more when you have a particular scenario chosen. Um, it's impractical to bring forward for public comment meaningfully if you have all four of these options completely laid out. Um, and so I, right now, I think they're looking for just that direction to get the kind of public comment. And no, of course, none of you have completely decided which one of these options you want until you've heard from the public. So I think it's fair to say now which, which one you favor for going forward. Um, but you'll stay open-minded as you hear from the public in this upcoming process. Uh, 
Okay, I think the next two counselors, we have Councilor Clark and then Councilor Syrett. Thank you, Mayor, very much. And again, thank you to staff for all of the work. Uh, this is a ton of work and for the presentation as well. Um, I think Chris brought up an excellent point. <clears throat> um, and so to take it a little bit further, I, I agree with him entirely that the suitability of uh, the economic suitability of land in the hills versus land in flat areas and, the, and, and the, what that means in terms of what can be built and what can affordably be built and what sort of housing comes of that is an important analysis. I know it's probably not in the statute, but my question to staff is, was there any kind of financial feasibility study done? In other words, what's the difference? So it's great to recognize that there's a difference, but we really ought to put numbers to it in my opinion, because we know, for example, that anything that's um, put up Bertelson uh, any farther is gonna require us to build a multi-million dollar pump station to get water up. And so what's the actual financial feasibility of one piece of land versus another? Have we done any analysis of that at all? We've done a serviceability analysis as part of our suitability analysis where we asked our service providers to give us a high level range of cost and ease of serviceability of our 18 different sub areas. We did not get down to the parcel level. Um, we're operating much more at the 30,000 feet here, but we did get really great information from our service providers and they That's were awesome. able to rank all of our sub areas by ease of serviceability and give us a ballpark estimate um, costs and ease of servicing those areas that did go into play in some of those areas that we removed from consideration for this in the suitability analysis like the Dillard Road area which is extremely expensive to serve because it's on the back side of the ridge line and it's one road in and one road out so yeah. things like that yes can you uh, characterize what Part the financial feasibility played in the in the um, decisions of the technical advisory group and the planning commission. I cannot speak for those groups, but I can tell you that the serviceability analysis was part of the four criteria that we used in our suitability analysis, and all of those criteria needed to be balanced against each other to deem whether that land was suitable to move forward. So I can't speak specifically for those groups. I, I, for one, would be very interested in having that information as clearly delineated as possible, the financial aspects of it presented to council when that part comes forward. <clears throat> my, I can't see a clock here and I don't want to run over, but um, my second question would be around um, the designations that we began the process with are, unless I'm misunderstanding them, our county designations that, and, and, and my question would be, how long has it been since county reviewed their de designations and has there been any kind of on the ground analysis? And the reason I ask that question is because I know, for example, there's a parcel out West 11th that a very large parcel out West 11th on the south side of it, as you get out towards the very end before you turn and start going near Fern Ridge or Green Hill, that is designated forest and you can drive by it and see that there isn't a single tree on it. And so, and, and when it comes to some of the lands that <clears throat> we designated as class one soils, I would have similar questions about utility around how long has it been since anything was actually grown on it or that it was used in that capacity and have someone tell you whether or not that analysis impacts how people are actually using it today. Are any of those um, done in this process, number one, and number two, when was the last time the county reviewed those designations? So I'll let Lindsay answer the question about uh, when county designated it. Um, but I will tell you, you're, we're not looking at use, we're looking at designation and soils. Right. You could um, be growing ryegrass on class one soils, but we're not looking at how it's currently being used, but how it could be used in the future. Um, 
So I can answer that piece and I will uh, punt it to Lindsay for the county question. So the, hi, good evening. Uh, so the current uh, comprehensive plan that we have went into effect in 1984. And that's the last time we've done an extensive um, overview of the farm and forest lands. Um, so if I could, I apologize for interrupting. So that which we're calling class one soils and farm and forest land haven't been actually reviewed for their utility for that in 35 years. We have not reviewed individual properties, um, but we're constantly working with um, the state on in, in this process, we use the most recent soil maps, um, the USGS soil survey maps um, to uh, determine what the soil classifications were. And they don't change very much. Really? They don't? Well, I'd be happy to debate that with you, Alan, if you like, but let's do that another day. Thank you for the information. I appreciate that. We're happy to send you follow-up information on the soils classification and on the serviceability analysis. Thank you. Okay, hey, Councilor Syrett. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much for the presentation and the hard work. And thanks to the technical advisory committee, especially for digging into the technical aspects of this, um, you know, uh, challenging work. Um, so I just want to kind of remind us that the city and the county, you know, we've made decisions in our adoption of Envision Eugene, Eugene that commit us to growing more densely and thus limit our need to expand beyond our current, current urban growth boundary for as long as possible. And this was out of a desire to preserve our farmland and open spaces, as well as for other reasons, such as combating climate change by limiting sprawl. So I feel okay with selecting one of these options as part of our required land use planning process, knowing that our need to actually bring this land into the UGB is likely to be, you know, decades out. We can't know what other changes might happen and how we address housing and other needs for our city's growth in the future. I do know that Eugene has a strong commitment to limiting our growth into our rural lands and I have confidence that commitment will forestall that expansion for a long time to come. I would lean towards selecting the Planning Commission's technical advisory recommendation of the 27 year option, as it will ensure those higher value farmlands are preserved for agriculture and not included for housing or other needs. We are talking about a difference of 425 acres between the 30 year option and the 27 year option. I think the trade offs of preserving our vital farmland versus having a small limitation on where we can build housing is worth it. Housing options can be varied and reworked to meet our needs. Farmland lost cannot be replaced by creating it somewhere else. Um, so I do have a couple of questions. Uh, re so my understanding is the city and the county each need to choose an option that would go forward for further public scrutiny and public hearing and technical analysis. What if we don't agree on the same option? Ah, that's the $30,000 question. <laughs> but Emily's here with the official answer. Yeah. Answering the question. So the process that you're being asked to um, participate in right now is not a legally required process. Um, it's just a, it's just an important one because this is a regional issue and both bodies need to take action. So it makes sense to get both bodies um, agreement on how to move forward at this point. So with that, that this is not a legal, I'm not basing this answer on, on any particular law. Um, probably what would happen if the council came up with one recommendation and the commission came up with a different, or the board came up with a different uh, recommendation, we would reconvene. Um, it doesn't, it's impractical that two different options would be uh, created because of all the work that's involved and it would also be confusing to the public. So um, this is initiated by the city, the urban reserve project, but it really is a joint venture. We're gonna, if we go according to schedule, the city council will come up with its recommendation first 
Then uh, a week later, a week and a day later, on the 20th of October, the uh, board will be asked basically whether it can get behind the city's recommendation and, and agree with it. As I said, if that doesn't happen, we'll probably all get back together and maybe do some joint deliberating or do what we can to come up with one um, direction for staff to move forward with. And that doesn't mean that that's what will get adopted in 2021 after the public input, but it would um, be important that we're all on the same page at this point. Great. So that leads to my second question or just observation, if I'm understanding um, what was said earlier correctly. So we, we need to land on one that we're then going to move into a more uh, public process, vetting, scrutiny. And in the course of that, we may decide to change the parameters of that option. Um, and I pose it kind of as a question because you know, I'm seeing there's a lot of constraints that the state has put on us in terms of how we do this process. You know, I asked, why couldn't we remove these lands from this part, but not from this part? And I was told, no, if you remove a certain category of lands, you have to remove it from the whole map. Right. Um, and that's, are, that's where I get to start being the unpopular uh, player who says, mm, no, it probably can't do that. Probably can't do that. Um, it is very prescriptive, the state law, as to how this process works. And it's exactly right, you know, as Councillor Pryor mentioned earlier, that initially we set out to come back with a five-year option, a 15-year option, you know, these different, and that made no sense because the law leads you to look at the land and the land leads you to come up with certain um, kind of benchmark possibilities. It, there's not a lot of leeway involved, um, but if someone said, I really, really want to see what a 17-year option looks like, uh, staff could do the plus and minus and show you what that land would look like. It may not make a lot of sense, um, but there are other options. So remaining open to those possibilities and also remaining open to it, things like, um, as Councillor Clark said, maybe we're wrong about some of the land or maybe between now and that time, the county changes the designation of some of it. So things could change. It is important to be really open as decision makers once you get that one option to still consider what folks are saying and changes could be made. So I know I'm out of time. But I'll just say one last thing. I, I think it would be great if staff could give us some kind of little primer on the things that we might adjust after, you know, in response mm -hmm. to public comment. We can bring that back to you or send that before the next meeting, if you like. Commissioner Farr, I believe you're next in queue, and I do see hands up for the other commissioners um, and participants, so I'll continue to go in order there. Thank you, Chair Buck, Mayor Venice. Uh, thank you for the presentation today. Uh, little, I'm going to tell a little story, then ask a question. A couple of weeks ago, my wife and I were camping in central Oregon. We have a tiny teardrop trailer with a tiny holding tank. We went to the, uh, the sewage dump uh, to uh, drain our trailer. And in front of us was a very large trailer. He was taking a lot of time on the dump and he had brand new plates on the trailer. Uh, so he just bought it. I, I got to talking with him and it, once again, he was taking a long time on the dump, didn't know how to do it. It was his first time. Asked him about who uh, we were talking about, where he was from. And he was pleased to have moved up here because a lot more value for his dollar buying a house in the Willamette Valley than it did in SoCal where he just moved from. His job was portable. He's a climate refugee. I brought his family up here. I think we're gonna expect to see more of that. My first question is what consideration in the uh, in the project uh, the population projections that we have what consideration has been taken to climate refugees The Portland State University population projections are the newest ones possible from 2019 and they're the ones required for us to use and for all the cities and counties in the state to use and they look at lots of things, but they don't project for potential climate refugees at this point. What they do look at is in-migration and out-migration as one of the pieces. So if that's already happening, then they're projecting that out, but they are not yet specifically looking at climate refugees as part of their forecasts. Thank you. So I think we're missing a there because many of the councilors and, and some of the county commissioners have been talking time about how we can expect a great many climate refugees and recent weather events uh, certainly uh, corroborate that um, that uh, expectation. 
So if we find that we choose 27 years or 29 years or 30 years, uh, urban uh, land in the urban reserve, and that land is eaten up very, very quickly because we have far more climate refugees uh, coming to our area than we anticipated. What happens then? What if we use uh, uh, 25 years in, the, in 10 years? Yeah, that's a great question because it's an estimate and we could use that land faster than projected or we could use that land slower than projected. So if in, in this case we use it faster than projected, then the decision makers can decide what they want to do next, whether they want to redirect uh, staff to do an urban reserves process again, or whether we want to look at other ways to accommodate our growth. Thank you. So future city councils and county commissions may be faced with a dilemma that we've used up all of the land that this city council, this county commission has designated for urban reserve, and they need to look at it again to see how do we add more urban reserve or more spread of uh, residential for the incoming climate refugees and others, which are included with the, uh, with the several thousand graduates we have of high schools every year, the organic growth in the area, which certainly has some out migration, but there's, uh, we, we have people who grew up here who would like to live here who are being displaced by people who can buy a house for half the price and their job is portable, so they move here. So um, my third question is, uh, as we consider urban growth boundary for uh, the city of Eugene, have we considered uh, what smaller jurisdictions doing, like Junction, which recently grew to almost to Eugene, uh, and other, other jurisdictions, what are they doing to accommodate growth? Should we not adequately accommodate residential growth in, in uh, Eugene and Springfield? So we are coordinating with our adjacent jurisdictions, everyone within a two mile radius. Um, most of that coordination, honestly, is us telling them what we are up to so that they can plan accordingly. So I can't speak for those jurisdictions to tell you any specifics of what they're doing to accommodate needed housing, but I can tell you that they are all aware of the urban reserves project where the potential um, suitable lands lay. And in terms of Junction City, uh, their urban growth boundary was bordering our study area on the north. And we specifically, um, <clears throat> excuse me, cut the suitable lands off at Meadowview Road because that was really the sense that they had rather than their hard boundary, it was their soft boundary of where they felt that if they ever needed to expand their urban growth boundary, they wouldn't go past that. So we have discussed those issues specifically with them. Thank you. So just in summary, we are gonna get climate refugees. We're experiencing it. Jobs are portable even more now that we know how to use, uh, use portable uh, methods to have meetings. Expect climate refugees. Whether we choose 27 or 30 years, it doesn't matter because future city councils and future county commissions are going to be faced with the dilemma of uh, to follow the land, how do we identify more land? And finally, Junction City is very, very close, only a few hundred feet from Eugene now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So I have, um, Mike has raised his hand for Councillor Clark for a second round, but uh, Councillor Clark, I'm going to let Councillor Zelenka jump in because he hasn't had a first round yet. So. Councilor Zelenka, take it away. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, talk about climate refugees um, for a second. I actually don't believe that we are going to get a lot of climate refugees. Through history, people aren't that mobile. And in fact, if you look it up, the uh, average American lives 18 miles from where they grew up on average. and in the last two decades, we become less mobile, not more mobile. So there's very powerful social and economic ties to where we grew up that really most people do not move around very much, even under times of stress and, and other kinds of things. So I, we have to come overcome all of that kind of stuff, which is ingrained in decades and decades and of, of years to actually come up with a whole bunch of people moving up here because of climate change. Um, it's not going to be, as one could tell from the last couple of weeks, it ain't going to be paradise up here during climate change, that's for sure. I was going to suggest, uh, Commissioner Buck, that we allow a couple of first-time commissioner testimony 
just because of time. And then my, and then Councilor Clark, I will not neglect you, I promise. But I want to make- Mayor, Betty has her round. hand up. Okay. Oh, all right. I didn't see Betty. All right. I will let Betty have a first round. Excuse me. Thank you. Okay. I would, I, I can imagine we're going to start a lot of land speculation if we establish urban reserves. And I think that's a danger. Turn I, your microphone down to your face. Okay, who's the boss? Who's the boss that's telling me what to do? Is that it? Okay. Thank you, boss, whoever you are. Um, I do not approve. I don't think we should have any urban reserves. I think we'll start land speculation. I think we can. I think we should maintain the urban growth boundary as it is. And obviously, we should save all agricultural land and all forest land for the future of life in this community and to prevent more more global warm causing more global warming. Um, I don't understand why we have to. I don't know if the state can make us establish urban reserves or not, but I, I would prefer not to. If it turns out that we have to or people insist on doing it, I would do the least possible. But I think I see a lot of empty land in Eugene and there's land that could be, that has very little on it that could be multi-story housing. I, I, I saw in Irkutsk, Russia, for example, I saw multi-story housing where they're not they're not as expanding; they're just going up. And we could do that too if necessary. And we don't have to make room for people who want to come here. If there isn't room, they won't come. And I think we need what what um, Commissioner. Uh, for, former commissioner used to say, we need a green belt around the city to protect the agricultural land and the forest land just for the health of all of us and for the preservation of the planet. We need to, to keep the forest for the, for the our carbon sequestration. We need to keep agricultural land near us so that we aren't transporting food for a long distance and so that we have food security. Um, so my choice is none of the above, unless for some reason we have to do something, it would be the fourth one. Thank you. Commissioner Bernie. Um, first some questions about the methodology. Um, as I was taking numbers in the presentation, it seems to me that there's less than one third of 1% of just the residents of the city of Eugene that participated. So I'm wondering, am I wrong or is this absolutely insane to think that two or 300 people are what we're going to use to develop charts and graphs out? Thank you for the question. So um, I didn't do the math. I don't know what percentage of the population of Eugene is, well, but I do in fact know that it would be even lower if we factored in the fact that those folks living in our study area are not in the city of Eugene. They are in the county. Yeah. <laughs> they are in the county. And we've actually been hearing from folks formally and informally throughout the life of the project. You are absolutely correct that this is not statistically valid input, but we feel really good about having over 1300 people read our materials and participate and get more folks participating in our survey than we had in our in-person open houses back in January. So it gives us a sense of some of the public input and it certainly is not reason alone. I completely agree for you to make any decision. It is just information for you to have. No, thank you. And I am not a planner <laughs> and I'm not being critical. These are questions that came to my mind. 
I believe at some point it was stated that the data provided was not statistically valid, but it was useful. How can something be useful if it's not valid? So I could have our, uh, someone who's more of a statistician than I am talk to you about that, but it's not that it's not valid. It's not that it's not a statistically valid survey. It's people who chose to complete the survey. We didn't do a random sampling of the population. And I believe it's around 400 responses you need to have to get a statistically valid survey. Gotcha. So we wanted to make sure folks knew that we were not saying that this was one of those statistically valid surveys you see pollsters use. This was um, us the pollsters doing... isn't all that statistically valid either we've learned in the past. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Sure, no problem. Um, so it is information, it is 200, the survey itself was 210 folks who actually took the time to complete the survey. Um, and we know that it's a range of folks, we know that it's really only one person each who did it. And we know that it's folks from inside and outside of the urban growth boundary uh, and inside and outside of the study area, but we don't have any other information on them, just that they were interested enough to participate. Thank you. And um, Claire asked what was gonna be my riveting $64,000 question, which was, what if we don't agree? Um, and that was answered. So I would like just to make, oh, one other qu technical question. One of the slides identified based on which of the scenarios was desirable, how many um, units per acre would be developed. That had to make the assumption that you were going out, you weren't going up, is that correct? You're on mute, Rebecca. On mute. I knew I was bound to do that at some point tonight. Apologies. Um, so I believe you're referring to the average estimated residential capacity. So right. we're looking at, so that's an average estimate of the number of dwelling units per developable acre. So it's based on how land in the inside the UGB has developed in the past and it factors in the specific characteristics of the parcels that are in that option. So the okay. size, slope, elevation, it doesn't tell you this is how the land is gonna develop. It just gives you a sense um, of how it could and it allows you to make those generalizations across the entire study area. Thank you very much. Now I get to act like an elected official. I'll give you some of my thoughts. <laughs> um, all projections are based on the past. Six months ago, we did not have the civil unrest in the past except in the 60s. We did not have the kind of economic downturn we are except maybe some hybrid of the Great Depression and the Great Recession. Um, we, we have not had the science of climate change with us whether we're talking about projections of moving population estimate, energy costs, to a degree, it's all based upon data of the past. So here's what I'm going to suggest. I'm going to suggest that Councillor Farr made an excellent point, um, as did Councillor Clark, as did Commissioner Farr. We did not integrate into this, what does it cost to build a damn house and, and or an apartment structure or condominiums? or up in existing areas. Um, I think that that in a, a, a scenario where we will see unheard of um, migration, I, I may be wrong, Councillor Zelenka may be right, but I don't think so. Um, we are already seeing climate, not just climate refugees, but economic refugees from California. I mean, look around. The, there is a reason why affordability is going down and prices are going up and people are moving in and many of our population are being displaced. And I really, I really believe we need to factor in all of that or else we become a community that says, oh, it's terrible, homeless is terrible, housing affordability is terrible, but we cripple our ability to accommodate those needs.
Thank you. Shall I move on to one more commissioner that hasn't spoken yet? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Commissioner Bose. Thank you. A couple of quick questions first. What is the timing the state requires for comprehensive plans to be updated? How late was the city in starting the Envision Eugene process and how many years did it take to complete the Envision Eugene process? Terry or Alyssa, would you like to take the questions about the UGB process because those predated me? Or Emily. All right, struggling with my, oh, Emily. <laughs> you want an arm wrestle for it? No, uh, <laughs> I, I will just say that from a legal perspective, um, we paid very close attention. Over the years, there have been a number of different timelines. Long ago, there used to be something called periodic review that was enforced by the state and we had to participate in that. And we complied with our last periodic review. I think we got fully acknowledged um, sometime before the urban, urban growth boundary project began. Um, House Bill 3337, which was the one that required us to break up with Springfield, um, was uh, we, the city of Eugene met all of our required deadlines imposed by that statute. Um, we are under no legal obligation to be doing this work right now. Um, it is intended to basically make future urban growth boundary amendments uh, go a little bit more smooth, smoothly for, uh, for the city as growth occurs. But we are not late and, and haven't missed any deadlines related to this kind of work. Um, since our last periodic review ended, I believe in the 90s still, I'm not sure when it ended, I can't remember, but we're in good standing. So you still didn't answer the question, how long did Envision Eugene take from start to finish? So we're, what the city refers to as Envision Eugene is an ongoing project that's still occurring. So I'm not quite sure what you're, talk, what you're referring to. From start of the, the look at the comprehensive plan to when you actually adopted a comprehensive plan and it was acknowledged by the state, how many years? Again, I'm not sure. The, so the comprehensive, I'm, I'm not sure how to answer your question because it's not it's not hitting the mark with me. I don't quite know what you're at, what your yeah. plan, the the Estro plan. I think he's asking about from the I would and I would. I'm just going to fill in here, uh, Commissioner Bozovich, probably from when we initiated the buildable lands inventory, which a lot of people consider that to be the start to when um, council did the final adoption package and moved that through the state. And that had to have been at least 10 years is my recollection. So, for the herb, so you mean to adopt the urban growth boundary? Yes. That yeah. We did. yeah. Yeah. So I, I, having been in land development, having been on the technical advisory committee when I was at eWeb before 2010 and know, knew that it took about 10 years to adopt that, um, and I would beg to differ that all deadlines were, were adhered to. Um, the split with, with Springfield took Eugene a long time to adopt um, their own uh, boundaries separate in the Metro plan, um, well beyond what Springfield was able to do. My point is that process took over 10 years. And we're talking about looking at this extension, whether we wanna look at 27 or 30 years, it took 10 years just to go through that process. You know, and, and, and here we are, we're doing this actually not as a requirement, we're doing it as the settlement for settling that process without a bunch of appeals. The agreement was we were gonna move straight into an urban reserves process. Um, you know, as we look at this, the difference between the 27 and the 30 year may only be 425 acres but it is actually 3,653 dwellings because that 425 acres based on the, the estimated dwellings per acre is actually has a, a density capability of 8.6 dwelling units per acre. 
far more than the 4.85 you get in the, in the 27. Why? Because it's level land that can be efficiently developed to higher densities. Not the stuff in the South Hills where you have to weave roads up slopes and you can't get a square lot and you can't get efficient layout of urban facilities like water, sewer, and roads. So that area up there in that difference between 27 and 30 years is where you're going to be able to build higher density walkable neighborhoods that are affordable for people to buy. So I would ask folks to think about that. Think about how long it takes to get anything done through the planning process let alone if we've gone through a bunch of appeals and think about the fact that we ought to adopt the 30 year version. Okay, I think uh, Councillor Evans, were you raising your hand to speak? Yes, I'll have a first round and then finally Councillor Clark, I will get back to you for your second round. Okay. Um, and I think I asked this question of you last week, Rebecca, when we were going and prepping for this meeting, but I, I kind of want to want to get this more out in terms of a, a discussion in, in this particular venue. Um, and, and I think that Jay alluded to it, um, uh, particularly when we're talking about um, growth and development in the north and northwest uh, corners. Uh, of Eugene and, and, and over in Lane County, we're gonna to need to uh, develop additional infrastructure uh, to support um, the things that, we're, that, that are naturally gonna be needed to um, you know, service the people that are going to buy houses um, and build houses in the area. And I'm talking about commercial development, and specifically, you know, commercial retail development, we're going to need far more restaurants, um, places to shop, maybe, maybe not, depending on how much we, you know, utilize, um, you know, the internet for, for you know, uh, Amazon and all the rest of that. But still, people are want to go, to go out to eat. They're going to want to do a lot of different things. And in, in addition to that, um, if you look at the plans for Bethel School District, uh, we're scheduled at some point to build a second high school. Now, you know, Kalapuya technically is, but to build a high school about the same, same you know, commensurate size as what Willamette is right now. Um, you know, I'm not sure if we are really looking at the total scope of the planning uh, that we need for that development, um, and particularly um, all of the other infrastructure things that need to go along with that, um, including new streets, new roads, um, you know, sewer lines, um, the whole nine yards. Um, you know, this is going to be a much bigger undertaking than just looking at um, additional housing because, you know, those people, people on, 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 on the north side of Meadow, Meadowview Road um, are not going to really want to come all the way down to Barger to shop at Winco. Um, they're going to have to have other nodes to be able to shop in. And so um, I, I really want us to look at um, what that really means in terms of, uh, you know, our future development. I, I, I think that um, we're going to have some issues there just based on, you know, the soils that we have, the wetlands that are around there, and where are we going to put these um, facilities? Yes, thank That's you for counselor. that. So um, it sounds like there are many voices that would be interested in seeing our serviceability analysis, and we will be sure to send that out to folks after the meeting. Like I said, we did have um, a very robust discussion about high level costs and ease of serviceability in different areas to help us define these 
suitable lands and help us evaluate the lands. We also did speak with Bethel schools and talked as, as well as other service providers in 4J to talk to them about their future school needs and whether there were areas that they had set aside for um, future schools, which um, Bethel does, and we have included that in the urban reserve area. Um, so, and also you're exactly right. Wetlands are an issue that will continue to be an issue. Other environmental factors that we looked at as part of our suitability analysis. But let me just note again that this land that would be held in reserve would be analyzed again on a more fine grained level if we needed to expand our urban growth boundary, depending on what those specific needs were, like you mentioned, do we need to expand for commercial? Is it housing? Is it industrial? Where do we need more land? And then we would reevaluate the urban reserve land to look at those factors that relate directly to the type of land we need and to look more specifically at the serviceability issues and the environmental issues um, as allowed by law. So this is the first pass analysis. It doesn't answer all of those questions, um, but it helps us in our decision-making process in the future. Okay, and Councillor Clark, second round. Thank you, Mayor. To my count, three county commissioners and at least three counselors were talking about the economics of building housing and how expensive it is to build it where. <clears throat> Emily Jerome, I'll give you a second here to pop on to the, there she is right there. So you'd mentioned that this is not a mandated state process, but it's one we've chosen to enter into. And while there are constraints and things we can't do, what we can do is relatively open to us. Am I wrong or right with regard to state? Yeah. So we can analyze for specifics of how much it costs per acre to build in so, in a way you know, that I mean I we we can we have leeway about whether we want to adopt urban reserves or not um, and that's what I mean by we have some choices but you know the very little case law that exists about urban reserves is very very clear about how prescriptive it is and jurisdictions that have tried to introduce important factors that seem very logical and good things to consider have been told they can't do so they're actually called by the courts extrinsic considerations and unless what you're considering fits under one of the prescribed uh considerations in the law you're not allowed to do it. So on some things that are brought up, I might say some of the concerns that you're bringing up, and this is why Rebecca keeps referring to them as um, cost to serve. We get to consider cost to serve, and there is a great deal of analysis in the record she'll share with you on that. We can consider social consequences at a certain point in the process, which is kind of broad and looks to me like a place a lot of your concerns might fit. But um, we can't consider things like, does this make sense from a planning perspective? That is was specifically sure. called expensive criterion. So what I would like to is what I would like to do is make sure that uh, you are paid wonderfully well to come up with the exact way we can look at this because it makes sense. And and I, I will say that um, there there were multiple comments here. This whole process over time. It's gone on for decades, arguably, is really about a clash of values. And if we don't have all the information to talk about what's really at, at, at you know, rubbing up against one another in terms of values, we can't make good decisions. And while I understand Betty's point of view entirely that, um, you know, we should never move the UGB ever, and we should never expand into these lands and never have them. Um, there's a there's a consequence for that, and the consequence is how expensive it's going to be to live here for everybody, and it's already bad. It's one of our third highest goals at the council is the cost of housing, and if we're not willing to take a look at these decisions in light of our third highest goal, in other words, how much does it cost to have enough housing, 
then I don't know that we're serving one of our most important goals. And with absolute respect to my friend, Councillor Zelenka, um, to suggest that people aren't moving here in droves at huger percentages than they have in the past is kind of ridiculous. Um, in the I same way, that. I wouldn't, in, in the same way, I wouldn't suggest uh, to him how to um, build an energy efficient building. I would say as someone who works in the real estate industry, um, it's incredible. We're at the lowest level of homes available for sale in history right now. And it's precisely because of the number of people coming here who want to buy them. The in-migration is huge by comparison to what we plan for. And I argued four or five years ago that we expand for climate refugees as a part of the analysis, but was voted down on that. And Portland State does not measure for that. I called Linda Prohl and talked with her about her methodology, and they do not measure for it. And we should be. When the county commissioners adopt the future population numbers, I certainly hope they're going to address that issue of climate refugees when they look at the Portland State numbers. But beyond all of that, Wait, we... Well, you got to wrap it up because we're over your time Last thing, we have a three-year window for relooking at the ugb am i right about that after our 17 adoption of the ugb sarah anyone we're due to bring you the first growth monitoring report in about a year i thought it was three why is it four it's three after acknowledgement of the ugb wouldn't that be useful information in this process? So we are using the growth monitoring information for consideration of how quickly and how much land we would need to expand the urban growth boundary. If we waited for the growth monitoring information for urban reserves, then we would wait even longer which is a concern that we have heard from folks from the beginning. So we're using the assumptions that were previously agreed upon and um, the direction that we were previously given. We're not considering um, it, Mayor. I saw you, I, I'll just end it with this. I certainly hope we can speed that up and take into account how we're actually growing before we finish this work. Because as Alan has said, we don't use a rear view mirror to drive a car. And we need to be looking forward, not backwards. Thank you. If I may add a few thoughts as well, you know, people are coming here in droves already. We know that. Um, what I don't want us to do is stick our heads in the sand about that. They will come no matter what we do or what we say because we have opportunities here that many people in the other parts of the United States simply don't have. And so part of having a healthy community is having reserves. So I feel strongly that we do need to have reserves. Um, I think without them, we're missing the mark on our future community. I take into serious consideration what the ETAC has put forward together. I know that we talked previously about the folks that did the survey online, which is great. We know it's not enough people that we wish we could hear from, but I know that the ETAC um, committee has taken a lot of time and a, uh, a lot of consideration on many different angles that we have spoken about tonight. So I'm gonna weigh my decision really heavily on what they have considered and brought forward for us. What I don't want to see is our city of Eugene becoming a place for, where only the elite can live because they're the only ones that can afford to live here. That's a really big concern. In addition to the location of the reserve, when you go up over the hill and the south side, I get concerned we'll have very elite suburbs 
going on um, because there is a higher cost. I do also understand that those are the least valuable soil. And that's important um, to utilize least valuable soils first. But that is a concern that I have. And we're getting closer and closer to the wildland interface. And for community that I serve, that's clearly a really big deal. So the closer we get to our forested areas, the more concerned I get as a, a responsibility of our board to allow growth, knowing that there is higher risk. Um, so I'll be thinking about those things as we move forward and talk both individually and if we have to talk again. Okay, thank you all for your comments. We are a little bit over and so I am going to, uh, to, to close this meeting. Thank you all for the discussion. Uh, it's, a, it's a significant topic. Uh, as you as we were reminded in the beginning of the meeting, the City Council will come back to this on October 12th. And uh, with that, I adjourn the City Council meeting. And I adjourn the Board of Commissioners meeting. Thank you. Have a good evening. Just a little bit. Thank you.